So we're going to start out with an overview of what the class is about. And this is a four-part overview. Each of these pieces will be five to ten minutes long, and I'll upload them along with all the other material we create in the course to my website and to my YouTube playlist for this class. So we'll start out by talking about the kind of the course philosophy at a high level, what the course is going to be covering, what the contents of the course will be, and then how the lecture material is all structured. If you've taken a class with me before, this should be pretty familiar, but if you haven't, this will provide a nice context to what we're going to be doing. So one of the things that motivates this class is the recognition that there's an increasing demand for software developers who can write concurrent and or parallel microservices for a range of computing platforms. And we'll talk a lot more about what a microservice is here shortly. But we're talking about things that can be accessed and or run on mobile devices, that can be accessed and or run on laptops, desktops, data centers, cloud computing environments, everything in between wearables and so on and so forth. So being able to have access to content from a variety of different form factors is very important. And of course, nowadays, we want to be able to get access to that content in a secure and scalable and efficient way. A lot of the motivation for what we're talking about here, are things like parallel computing or microservices or cluster computing, is driven by advances in software and hardware infrastructure over the past couple of decades. I'm sure you're all familiar with something called Moore's Law. Moore's Law really means that every 18 to 24 months, the number of transistors available on a computing hardware chipset will double. For many, many years, back from, say, the 70s up to the early 2000s time frame, Moore's Law also meant that every 18 to 24 months, the computer clock speeds would double. But as of the early 2000s, that kind of petered out. So systems didn't really get a lot faster in terms of the clock speed, but there were still a lot of transistors. And so one of the things that's changed, because we couldn't rely on just waiting 18 to 24 months to get things to run faster, we're moving more and more to multi-core platforms. Because we have plenty of transistors, and even though the clock speeds don't really get much faster, we can have more and more cores. So nowadays, almost all computing devices have at least two cores. Many computing devices, like my, my Android phone, has four cores. My laptop has 10 cores. And so those kinds of core rates are not uncommon, and they're growing and growing and growing. So clearly, there must be someone to take advantage of all that stuff. And of course, at the same time, we've also have much higher speed networks. So you can cluster together computers in the form of cloud environments where you can have lots and lots and lots of computers with lots and lots and lots of cores. So how to take advantage of all that hardware is important. And there's been advances in software infrastructure to enable accessing all those hardware resources. So that's a lot of what we're going to be talking about in this course, how to, how to harness the power of advances. I've taught these kinds of classes for a really long time. And in my experience, you can't just talk about these concepts in the abstract. It's, it's nice to think about concepts. It's important to think about principles and fundamentals. That's important. But you need to get further than that. You need to actually do real stuff. And so we're going to spend a lot of time in this class coming up with ways to apply patterns and different object-oriented, functional, interactive design and programming techniques in order to write software and read software that's hopefully easier to read and write, hopefully easier to maintain and modify, and also ideally more efficient, resilient, scalable, all these kinds of things. So there's going to be lots and lots of hands-on software development and testing in this class. And that's one of the things you'll, if, if you don't like to program, this probably is not the class for you, because we're going to do a lot of programming in this class. And there's also going to be a lot of material we're going to cover as well. So I'll cover that in just a minute. So what is going to be the focus of the course? Well, there are kind of three general topic areas we're going to talk about, one of which I'm, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on, because this is really covered in other classes. But we'll show some examples at the beginning in this, because it's such a nice programming abstraction. This is the Java Streams framework, which basically allows for taking data and then processing it through a series of so-called intermediate operations in a pipeline yielding results. So we're going to do a little bit of stuff with streams. And luckily, I have lots of videos if you need to learn more about streams or Java functional programming or Java object-oriented programming. I have tons of material you can go to get a refresher if you need to learn a bit more about that. 
We're also going to talk about another really interesting topic, which is brand spanking new as of the end of 2022, something called Java Structured Concurrency. And we'll talk a lot about that, especially at the beginning of the course, because this is very much part and parcel of modern microservice-based approaches. And these include things like Java Virtual Threads, and it also includes this concept of structured concurrency, and we'll talk about what that means very quickly. And then towards the middle to later part of the course, we're going to switch over to talking about something called reactive streams, which is also a paradigm that's been around for maybe five or six years or so, and has become quite popular in certain contexts, especially if you're trying to build very scalable uh, infrastructure for things like cloud computing environments and so on. And so these are the three kind of core topics we're going to talk about. And I, I do assume that you know Java, at least a, a little bit. Um, I assume you know Java object-oriented programming, and I assume you can pick up on the functional programming features quickly, uh, even though that's not really the focus of the class. And again, I'll point you to some resources when we talk about the course website where you can go to learn more about this. We're also going to spend a lot of time focusing on modern web programming platforms. And we're going to use something called Spring Boot, and we're going to focus on something called Spring Web MVC. MVC stands for Model View Controller and Spring Web Flux. And I'll talk a lot more about that. We'll probably start doing that in earnest here once I get to the intro material. And you'll see that there's a couple of different paradigms for programming on these Spring platforms, one of which is designed more for so-called synchronous programming, where you make a request and you wait until the response comes back. And the other is what's called asynchronous programming, where you make a request, you get back a future or some proxy for the results, and then the computations take place in the background, and you get notified later through some clever means that things are done. So that's going to be a big, big, big focus. This is what kind of differentiates this course from other courses that I teach is the focus on spraying and web programming. We're also going to talk about patterns for concurrent and parallel programming, because patterns are important to get the bigger picture view. And there's all kinds of different places to learn about these patterns. And I have some books I've written on them. There's other material we'll talk about. So that's going to be kind of an underlying theme through a lot of the material to get the bigger picture concept fundamentals view. And I'm assuming that either you know or can very, very quickly learn modern Java. Here's a good example of a book on modern Java. And modern Java is Java that deals with functional programming. You can also learn how to use IntelliJ. If you've ever used Android Studio, it's very similar to using Android Studio. In fact, it's built as a plug-in on top of Android Studio. And Git, which hopefully you've been exposed to in other courses, but if you haven't, you'll get a chance to learn how to use Git, which is a source code management system. And if you take a look at the course website, and oh, by the way, I'll put all these slides up on the website so you don't have to copy the links down. Uh, you can see I have some pointers to resources where you can learn about this stuff if you need to get more knowledge about these concepts. So how is the lecture material structured? So we're going to have a focus on Java structured concurrency and reactive streams. And this is going to focus on those structured concurrency mechanisms, as well as this thing called Project Reactor, which is a reactive streams model. For those of you who've taken other classes with me before, last semester I taught a course that was on parallel functional programming, and we used something called RxJava as the reactive streams programming framework. Project Reactor is a variant of reactive streams, which is a little bit more modern, and a little bit more interesting than RxJava, but they're very similar. So if you took that class, you'll have a good feel for some of the stuff we're going to cover later. Uh, like I said, the bulk of the focus is going to be on synchronous and asynchronous web communication and web programming with Spring Web MVC, which is the synchronous communication, and Spring Web Flux, which is the async web communication. And these are very much industrial strength, widely used platforms for building web-based applications, and then these concurrent and parallel patterns. The course is going to have a bunch of lessons and the lessons are composed of parts, and each part is going to be a single lecture. So as I create this material, I'm going to be uploading the parts and the PDF versions of the slides that correspond to the parts to my website, and this is where you can go. We'll look at that in a more detail in a second. And so everything will be up there and available for your viewing pleasure, and uh, we'll talk a lot later about how you can use that material throughout the course. Um, there will be quizzes every other week. The phrase bi-weekly is a little confusing because maybe it's twice a week or maybe it's every two weeks. This is every two weeks. 
and it'll be on material covered in the lectures and in the programming assignments during that period of time. And uh, to motivate class participation and class attendance, I very often take questions from the discussions in class, and those become what are in the quiz. And so it's very important that you attend class so that you've got a heads up on what's going to be on the quiz. The first quiz will be a week from Wednesday, so January 18th. And they will be done through Brightspace, so we don't have to take class time for this. And they'll be closed book, closed note, closed internet. You just have to base on what you've learned studying for the quiz. Uh, the goal is to get the quizzes handed back and reviewed at the start of the next class. So we have them on Wednesday, give them back to you on uh, next Monday, and I'll talk about them and go through the, the quiz, quiz uh, answers. That's why you cannot retake a quiz uh, once you've missed it. So if you're going to not be able to take the quiz, send me an email before you miss the quiz so we can figure out some arrangement, some accommodation. But you can't show up a week later and say, oh, I, I forgot to take the quiz. Can I take it? No, you have to take the quiz when it's due. And, and that's because we go over it in class. Uh, the way to, best way to rec uh, that I recommend for studying for the quiz is to review the slides and or the videos, because they'll all be online. And of course, also uh, take a look at the programming assignments. And there will be videos with my feedback on the programming assignments, because I review them. We'll talk about that in a minute. And that's also another fertile place to get questions is from the uh, re reviews and feedback I give on the programming assignments. So again, you can go back and watch the videos. You can speed them up, play them twice as fast, or play, play them back half as fast if you think I talk too fast. But it's all there, so you'll be able to learn from watching those things. People generally tend to like having access to the material. Uh, unfortunately, as you will discover, I tend to make changes to the material all the way up to the class starting point. So I don't put the material out ahead of class. I put it out after class. Depending on a variety of factors, there may or may not be a cumulative final exam that, at least in theory, covers all the material in the class. Usually, if we have one, we often don't. It'll just cover the stuff from the last couple weeks of the semester between the last quiz and the final. The reason why we often don't have a final is sometimes the final assignment goes a little long. And so I don't want to have you have to do both studying for the final and finish up your final project into exam week. So depending on how things go, we may or may not have it. If we do have it, it'll be held here from noon to 3 PM on Friday, April 28th. Actually, it won't be here. It'll be via Brightspace. But it'll be on that time. So that's the end of part one.